Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes for Clark College Network Technology Department. Today we're going to be covering IPv4 addressing. This is Lecture 2 of Module 2 for the IP subnetting in Tech 103 course. Let's look at a definition of an IPv4 address, or any IP address. Its job is to uniquely identify devices, we sometimes call a device a node, and it will uniquely identify them on our global network. So every device on the internet has an IP address. That could be a phone, a printer, a PC, a laptop, a tablet, any kind of device you can think of. These numbers can be grouped by geography. We can also group them by function, like all the uh, printers given one group of these addresses, all the servers another group of these addresses, the phones and so on. But they are handed out as we'll see in a moment on a geographic basis by pretty much by continent, by country and sometimes by state and region. Characteristics of the IPv4 address is it is a 32-bit number so it's a binary number and it's always 32 bits long. So if you were to look at it in binary it's a 32-bit number for convenience of writing it in decimal, we split it into four 8-bit parts. Don't think of these parts as having any particular meaning. It's just a convenient way to break up the number. So they will break it into four 8-bit parts and separate each one with a dot. And then the 8 bits is converted to a decimal number. You'll see that here in the example, 172.16.0.254 is an example of an IPv4 address written in what we call dotted decimal. This is the way humans would write the number, type it into a system, and then it is promptly converted to a 32-bit binary number used by the machine. Notice that the number like 172 would be turned into 8 bits, and then the 16 turned into 8 bits, and then the 0 turned into 8 bits, and the 254 turned into 8 bits. Each group of 8 bits can be a decimal number of 0 through 255. If you recall from our last module, we learned how to convert decimal to binary and binary to decimal. And you would notice that an 8-bit value, 8 binary bits, if they're all turned on, all 1s, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, you would have the number 255. 256 is the number of values you can have, right? Because you're starting count at zero. You count zero, one, so if you go zero, one, two, three, you have four values, zero through three. So zero through 255 is 256 values or things that can be represented, 256 machines or whatever you're measuring. But the value is only 255. If you were to write 256, it would actually convert into binary into a nine digit number. It would be a one followed by eight zeros. So that would be an invalid number. You can't put a 256 or a 313 in a dotted decimal IPv4 address because remember that each octet or byte is only eight bits. Let's talk about governing authorities. We have a lot of different organizations that help us keep these numbers organized and um, handed out in an orderly way. They try to conserve the numbers and make sure they're used appropriately. The largest of these is IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. It is its job to manage the IP address space globally. So they ultimately handle or control all of the addresses in the world, all the IP addresses. They then hand them out to the RIRs, the RARs, which are the regional internet registries. There's five of them and they're essentially aligned to the continents. And each RIR is in charge of IANA. So there are uh, the leaders of each RIR organization sit on the board of IANA. So it's a very democratic kind of uh, layout. The reason for this is to make sure that all the stakeholders in the 30 plus countries around the world that participate in the internet actively are um, represented so that they feel like they're part of the governing decisions of this network. If they weren't, um, countries might go off and just start their own internet and then you'd have this fragmentation where we would no longer have this wonderful global uh, connected network. We have to have kind of one uh, global network to make the internet really work efficiently. So these are um, how we lay it out. 
other organizations like the NRO is uh, an organization which is uh, developed out of the five RIRs and its job is to try to uh, resource manage so keep track of and really conserve the remaining IP addresses and so that's the unallocated internet address numbers. The ones that are allocated that have been handed out it's like spilled milk they're already out in what we call in the wild and they've been assigned to companies and organizations and homes and they really can't be reeled back in very easily and so instead uh, we focus on the numbers that have not yet been assigned out and try to conserve those and, and put those out in a, in a smart way. Another organization to know about is called ICANN. ICANN um, doesn't I mean it deals with um, the numbers the IP addresses but its job is really connecting them to names which this is the cool thing we all use the internet this way we type yahoo.com or myspace.com or something right dot com dot org dot gov and those names are what humans use to surf the internet they're also what we use when we send an email like dhughes at clark.edu is actually attached to an IP address so my email is actually an IP address but we prefer to use the names. Names are how we're going to access most of the resources on our networks and so ICANN helps make sure the names stay unique because you've got to have unique names attached to unique IP addresses. So for instance my URL DwightHughes.com is unique and no one else in the world has it. I have to pay a small amount of money to keep that registered to me and then I can assign that to the IP address of my server. Let's take a look at the IPv4 classes. There are five of them. We we'll do a little board work. This is information right out of the inside fold of your first packet and we're going to do a little uh, board work here and take a look at some of this. In Tech 103 whiteboard session. These are the five classes of IPv4 addresses. Okay, and the first three classes, A, B, and C here, are what we call unicast. That means a one-to-one. -one. So if I was trying to contact you, my computer, to your computer, that's a one-to-one -one communication. Class D, that's multicast. That means one-to-many. So if my computer was trying to send the same message to a group of computers, I could use a multicast to more efficiently do that. I could use unicast, but I'd have to send them directly to each, and that would take more bandwidth and more time. We also have a third type called broadcast. And that's a one to every. So that's um, a message to everyone. And broadcasts are actually part of unicast addressing. And we'll look at that next module when we get into subnetting. We'll learn how we find the broadcast address of every unicast address. So every unicast network has an assigned broadcast address as part of it. So it doesn't have its own class. But unicast class is ABC, and that would also encompass some broadcasts. Multicasts are class D, and class E was never assigned, so I'm going to call it undefined. You really don't have to worry about it, except for this one address here. They did use one of the class E addresses as a broadcast. So there's your global broadcast um, taken out of the class E. But the rest of the class E is unused. It will never be used because um, it's one of the smaller groups of addresses. If we were to draw these as a circle, you would see that one half are class A. Okay. We know that because class A addresses all have a leading bit of zero. Okay. And so that would be half of all addresses start with a zero, the other half would start with a one. So then half of a half is going to be class B addresses, then half of a half of a half, C, and then D and E take up the remaining, like that. So that's a pie chart of how IPv4 addresses are allocated into the five classes. So what's this leading bit 
jazz. This is a way that you can tell if an address is an A, B, C, D, or E address is looking at the leading bits. So leading bit 0, leading bit 10, 110, 1110, or 1111. This is just an alternative way to memorizing these ranges of addresses here. So you could memorize this decimal range and then look at a decimal address. There's a dotted decimal IPv4 address. And if we look at the leftmost octet, 172, in this table, we can see it fits nicely in the class B range between 128 and 191. 172 would be a class B address. But let's look at it in binary for a second. There'd be a 128, no 64. Oh, I can just stop there. 1, 0. I have a match right here with 1, 0. So notice that I just started converting 172. I don't have to finish it. I could if I wanted to. I thought it would be 160 and 172. So I could finish it off, but I really only needed to go that far. Just the leading bits tells me that this is a class B address. This is, in fact, exactly how the machines determine class. The bits, if you can envision this, are moving down the wire one by one. They're moving across the internet, through the air, however they're moving. They're being sent as electrical pulses or light pulses, so one, zero, one, zero. So as they're coming in, without even having to receive the entire IP address, a device will know the class by the first couple bits that come in the door. And so as the IP address is arriving, it can know the class, which is helpful in terms of knowing what to do next with the address. Okay, let's take a look at some more of this with the classes. So if we, there we are. So if we want to go ahead and do something called anding, which is covered in your packet on, I think, pages three through five, something like that, it'll teach you the anding process. Essentially, anything times a zero equals zero. That's really what anding says. So really, you have to have two ones to get a one. All right, so what do we and? We and an IP address with its mask. Now, every IP address has a mask, a mask called a subnet mask is a companion address to an IP address. And that subnet mask provides the information needed to decipher the IP address. So I like to think of a subnet mask as a key to unlock the meaning of an IP address. An IP address has two parts mainly. It has a network part, so there are network bits, and there are host bits. Okay. And the network bits tell us what group this IP address belongs to. So there would be a bunch of IP addresses in the same group or container. And so this IP address belongs to the group 17216. It is a member of that group and its member identifier or host. Host would be the node or machine um, address is 3212. So the two together make a complete address. The question is always where do the network bits end and where do the host bits begin because this is a flexible bar that can be moved. To know where this bar has been placed, you need the mask. The mask unlocks the location of this. Notice what's happening here is a mask is all binary ones and then all binary zeros. And it creates a point. If we look at it in binary, you can see it better. Let me show you the mask here. This is the IP address and the mask written out in binary. You'll see very nicely that you always have all ones and then at the point that it transitions to zeros is where that line goes, meaning that these are my host bits here and these are my network bits here. Let's apply anding to this. Anding is a process. The goal of anding is to strip off these host bits like that and replace them with zeros. Look, I just did it right there. Most times you can AND without going to binary, but we're going to go to binary so you understand the process. If I take a 1 times 1, I get a 1. Anything times a 0 is 0. Okay. Look what I ANDed that into. It's the same number I started with. So the network bits drop through and remain unaltered. You'll see that again here.
Okay. So my network bits remain unaltered and I end up with the same number that I started with. Now it's going to get weird. The opposite is going to happen. It strips off the host bits. And it leaves me with the number And this number is special. This is called my network ID. Okay. So that will be the my network ID, which is the first address in a list of, of IP addresses, and it identifies the network or subnetwork. So let me give you an idea of a list. Let's say I have the addresses 0, 1, 2, 3. I'm not going to write out full IP addresses for this. This will suffice. So if we convert this to binary, I would have a 0, 0, and a 0, 1, and a 1, 0, and a 1, 1. These would be the binary equivalents of these IPv4 type addresses. So the network ID is always the first of these addresses. In fact, it's unique in that the host bits are always zero. So you can look at any address and if you see all zeros where the host bits are, you know you have the special address network ID. Also, know that you can take any IP address. You can just take one at random, one off of your computer tonight, and you can strip off its host bits and know what the network ID for your group would be. So there are three addresses inside of every IP address. One is the network ID. The other is the broadcast. The broadcast is always the last address in the group and it always has all ones for the host bits. And I bet we could do that right here. We could just put ones for the host bits. Right. And we'd leave these numbers the same. I won't rewrite them. We'll just write this. And of course, all ones turns into 255. 255. So my broadcast for this network. Okay, so now you know how to find the first and last, which would be the net ID and the broadcast. And what's left in the middle, these addresses here, are what we call valid hosts, sometimes called usable hosts. Like that. So valid or usable hosts are the ones that we can actually put on printers and PCs and phones and our devices. So if you have any list of numbers, it doesn't matter how big the group is, if you had 128 numbers in a group, say, you would not be able to ever use the first or the last because they're reserved. The first address is the all zero host, reserved as the network ID, and the broadcast is the all ones host, which is the broadcast for that group. So if I need to send a message to the group, I would send it to that broadcast address and it would shout it out to everyone in the group. Pretty cool. And the first address is the identifier to be able to route or find the group, if you will, it's your mailing address for that group. So that identifies where that group is, it's, it's, its ID. And so those are very important concepts to get down that we can accomplish while we're studying ANDing. There's, again, not a lot of need to go to the binary every time you AND. The private IP address space was added later to deal with an issue of a shortage of IP addresses. The phenomenal exponential growth of the internet meant that the address pool that they had set aside for the internet started to run dry. And to kind of keep it going, they had to set aside some private addresses. I want to use an analogy of a phone number for you. 
if you had a public phone number, which you do and I do, that means anyone can call you at that number anywhere in the world. So anybody could pick up a phone and reach you. That's what a public IP address is. It's an IP address that allows you to get on the internet and be reached across the internet. A private address cannot get on the internet and cannot be reached directly across the internet. It can be reached through something called NAT, Network Address Translation, that we won't be talking about in this class. Future classes, if you take a networking course, will deal with NAT, how to configure it, what it is, but in this course we don't. But to do NAT, you would need these private addresses. Sometimes we use the private addresses anyways um, on a printer, for instance. If you have a printer in your home or in your office, it's unlikely you need or want to print to that printer from across the internet. You typically only print to the printer when you're in that room or that building or that company. So you can use private addresses on a lot of devices that don't need to be reached across the internet. A subnet mask is a companion address that we add to an IP address. So if you don't have a subnet mask, you just have an IP address written down, you still have a subnet mask. We would use the default for the class. We'll take a look at this. Okay, so I take that address right like that, and I need to apply it subnet mask. So each class has a subnet mask, and if we were to make a, a little table over here, we could uh, put those masks out here. So if we look at these, the 255, this means I have eight network bits in this one, and then I have 16 network bits in a class B, and then I have 24 network bits in a class C, and that just means that there are a lot more class C networks, but each one has fewer hosts than there are class Bs. Class B, there are two to the 16 class B networks, but each one has a lot more hosts. That's how that works. And class D, look at this weird guy, no hosts at all. Right? There's no zeros in here, and so it's all network. A class D is a multicast, and there it has no, um, no hosts. We're not really going to do a whole lot with class D um, in this class, because there's not much we can do with it. Though Again, you'll study that in a future networking class. So that leaves us with really the ABCs of networking. We're going to deal with just the unicast classes. So the appropriate default subnet mask for this address, because 192, breaks into binary like this. That's 192 in binary. And notice it has a 110, which if you remember, I said that class A was 0, and B was 10, and C was 110. And so I know that this is a class C address because it begins with the leftmost bits of 110. That makes it a class C. That's how I'd like you to remember class. If we then apply the default mask, we can and this without even going to binary because the 192 will drop through, the 168 will drop through, and the 43 will drop through and any bits up here get wiped out, they get deleted. In this case I wrote the network ID already and so nothing really happens to it, it stays the same. But that's ending in a nutshell. If we have our subnet mass, I'll write them out again a little clearer so that we can see them. We can also write them in what we call CIDR notation. And that would be to write down just the number of ones. So this would be a slash 8, a slash 16, and a slash 24. If you recall, when we broke these into binary, this would have eight ones. And then it would have 24 zeros, making a 32-bit number. Well, since I know it's always a 32-bit number, I only need to write down the number of ones to put at the left, and I can just keep writing zeros until I hit 32. So it's just a shorthand instead of having to write the dotted decimal subnet mass. I'll show you how it's very helpful. So you could write the slash 24 and that would be the same as writing, it's kind of a crazy line there, it would be the same as writing 255, 255, 255, 0. So those are 
those are going to be synonymous. And so you're really going to enjoy writing CIDR notation as a shorthand to writing out the full dotted decimal subnet mask.